Welcome back ladies and gentlemen. In this video, I'm going to be covering a video response that the YouTube channel Proving Islam made in response to my videos on the Islamic Dilemma. So to anyone who's new here, the Islamic Dilemma is the claim made by non-Muslims that Islam is false and Muhammad is not a prophet and the Quran is not the word of God because the Quran does one big and fatal mistake. And it's not just an isolated mistake, it's a central theme in the Quran and it's a big one. That claim is that the Quran affirms in multiple different places that the Injil and the Torah are inspired, preserved and authoritative words of Allah that are present at the time of Muhammad. They even contain descriptions of Muhammad, believe it or not, so Muhammad can be found in them. The Quran itself confirms the Torah and the Injil and that's one of the arguments the Quran uses to demonstrate that you can believe the Quran is actually from God and Muhammad is actually a prophet. And so, yeah, you should just believe the Qur'an. The big problem, though, is that the Qur'an then, after confirming all these prior scriptures, like the Torah and the Injil, then goes on to immediately contradict the Torah and the Injil by making explicit statements that in no way can be reconciled with what the Gospel or the Torah say. Classic example, in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Jesus is crucified and then resurrected. In Surah 4, Ayah 157, that doesn't happen. In fact, it explicitly takes that event and denies it, at least according to traditional Sunni exegesis or tafsir of their religious texts. There are an absolute ton of these that we could go through, but that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is to just go through some criticism of the uh, Islamic dilemma and let's see if it can stand up to scrutiny. So let's look at this video response by Proving Islam and let's jump straight to it. Modern Muslim academic perspective of today is that the Quran is clearly saying Injil and Torah have been corrupted. There is fundamentally a core issue to the text of the Injil and Torah, but surprisingly that's not what the early Muslim scholars believed. In fact, what's interesting is I've not found a single example that was clear cut of an early Muslim scholar claiming that the Torah and Injil were generally, universally, corrupted textually, as in they were textually falsified, before the 11th century. I haven't found that. Just a quick point here. There's a reason why I use the term universal general textual corruption of either the Torah or the Injil. Because it's evident immediately that that's not the early Muslim position at all. Rather, this is a later development that happens most likely in the 11th century by people like Ibn Hazm and his contemporaries who advocated for a total shift in the way that they view the Torah and the Injil, instead of seeing it as the inspired word of God that was present at the time of Muhammad, it starts to change into, mm, no, it's, it's not that. It is definitely not that. And so my argument is very simple. The theology of tarif, or corruption, at the time of Muhammad is different than the theology of tarif at the present day. It has gone through development. And it has gone through development most likely because of interactions with Christians and Jews. The more knowledge people had about the Injil and the Torah, the more these contradictions were made aware, they were more apparent, they were more harder to hand wave or to classify as a different type of tarif, which we'll go to in this video. And instead, it just has to be the case that that Injil and that Torah that we have today cannot be the same one that was revealed to Musa and Isa. And a quick way of proving me wrong is just to demonstrate a clear cut case of a universal and general case where textual corruption has been applied to the Injil and Torah from the early Islamic scholars. That won't be found though, because that's not their position of early scholars. In fact, I can actually appeal to later scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah, who don't even think even in the 14th century that this is the case. If we actually look at the earliest Muslims, we do see that they believe that the Bible is corrupt. Small thing here as well, don't use the term Bible, because Bible is a term that implies a lot more than what I'm actually arguing for. I'm just talking about the Torah and the Injil. There's no need to add on other books because there's no need. If the Torah and the Injil that Muhammad has in his day is the same as what we have now, and Muhammad really did confirm this, then Islam is false. There doesn't need to be any more. It doesn't need to rely on Paul's letters, the works of James, the later epistles of John. It doesn't need that. It just needs the Injil or the Torah. And today we'll actually look at that from a testimony by Christians, early Christians, talking to Muslims and testifying that those Muslims who they're dialoguing with do believe in the corruption of the Bible. We'll also look at some Muslim sources, but uh, mainly we're going to discuss Christians talking about this. So the first text I actually want to show you here is an early Syriac uh, commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, 
And this text, it's dated to uh, 758 to 789 slash 790 AD. And you can see here that the person writes, they say that he was changing for us many things in the gospel. But this should be questioned as follows. When was it changed or being changed? Who are those who changed it? And so on. And he also says here uh, that, therefore, the gospel is true and everyone acknowledges and says that it is in the hands of the Christians. If not, what would be the true one according to him? And what would be the true books of the prophets according to those uh, pagans? So here, what you see is uh, this Christian is talking about the Muslim belief that the Bible is corrupted. So I'm not really too sure what the goal of this is. To quote Christian opinion on Islamic theology as a way of demonstrating what the correct Islamic theological view is seems very weird to me. Like I wouldn't go to rabbinic Jews to find out what I should believe about Jesus or what I should believe about the correct interpretation of the Torah. I'm obviously not going to do that because I'm aware that they have different beliefs and different presuppositions that I'm not going to agree with. Likewise, from an Islamic paradigm, why would you go to Christians? Seems like a very odd move, but okay. It's important to emphasize here that it's very easy for the average Christian to come to that conclusion based off what Muslims are telling them. Muslims, on one hand, are trying to say that the Quran confirms the Injil and Torah at the time of Muhammad, which is also the Torah and the Injil that the Christians have from that point onwards, because you know, textually, it wasn't changed after that point. Although some Muslims did actually think this, which, which is worth pointing out. But now we know that that's uh, an incorrect belief based on manuscript evidence. But at the same time, they're openly contradicting Christian and Jewish belief. Jesus never died on the cross. Jesus is not the son of God. Jesus was never resurrected. Jesus never said that you can pray to him in his name and he will answer your prayers. Jesus never said that he knows everything the Father knows. And he's not talking metaphorically, he's talking literally. Jesus was never called God. Jesus was never so on and so forth. Which to any Christian hearing that would immediately make them think, well, you're just saying that all of our scriptures are corrupted then. That we in no sense have whatever the Torah and the Injil is, but it's actually something totally different. Whereas the early Islamic perspective would have been a lot more nuanced in trying to say, well, we think a lot of it is misunderstood. It's Talif al-Mana. You've misunderstood what's being said here. Ibn Qutba, he specifically uses this when he tries to reconcile supposed contradictions in Hadith. This is the argument he appeals to while quoting Matthew and Mark. Now, this is the big part that I think proving Islam has, has completely missed here. It's not sufficient simply to say textual corruption means universal or general textual corruption. There's actually a much more weaker, a much more prima facie, sensible and rational understanding of this, which is simply what the Quran says, actually, that some people distorted some words of the text. To say that it actually, no, 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 it's not, <laughs> it's not that some people distorted some of the words, it's that everyone has distorted all of the words because every instance of the Torah and the Injil has been totally changed from its original. The original does not exist at all in any form, either through oral tradition or written tradition. This would be, to be honest with you, uh, unthinkable. I mean, even, even Islamic scholars that appear much later in the medieval period, like Ibn Taymiyyah, he understands the fact that that accusation is kind of baseless because no one can prove that all this stuff has been changed and no one can prove that it hasn't been changed. You, you just make the assertion. Likewise, no one can demonstrate that some form of universal across all of Christendom and across all of the Jewish diaspora, that either the Torah or the Injil, it has to be the Injil edited by Christians across Christendom in multiple different languages with cooperation from Jews in all of the diaspora with multiple different languages agreeing to this and making the same edits in their own Torah that the Christians are making in their Torah. No one can prove this because it's irrational. No one can even begin to comprehend how that would even work, why that would work, why would the Jews and the Christians who don't have the best of relations at this point in history, why would they collaborate on this, this strange universal international Torah editing competition? Evidently, that's baseless. And not only that, it's purely impractical and just downright irrational, to be honest with you. But this is what you'd have to believe if you really thought that there was universal corruption. So evidently universal corruption is off the table. It's irrelevant as to whether or not the Christians may have perceived it that way. You really shouldn't let Christian polemical discussions determine your own theology. Like it's, <laughs> it's your prophet, your Quran and your Sunnah that determine your theology. It's not 
It's not what uh, the Pope said. <laughs> it's not what Pope Leo the Third thought. I'm not sure why you think that's authoritative. And even if they did think, get that impression that it was universal textual corruption, that that's what the Muslims were claiming, I would need to see that from Muslims. I would need to see that from Islamic scholars who explicitly state there has been universal general corruption, just like I stated in that video, and that the Torah and the Injil do not exist anymore. There is no unaltered Islamic Injil or Torah at the time of Muhammad that Muhammad was referring to when he said that he could find his description written in these supposed Islamic and Jewel and Islamic Torah. You would need to give me evidence that that was their view. From the works that I've read, that doesn't seem to be it at all, and it also doesn't seem to be the view of many contemporary modern scholars. Dr. Gordon Nicol, he explicitly rejects the view that the early Muslims held to a strong understanding of Talif. His understanding is the majority of it was Talif al manna and he backs that up by looking at Ibn Qutayba, Muqattal ibn Suleiman, ibn Ishaq al-Tabri, that don't seem to hold that strong of a view. In fact, the closest you get seems to be al-Tabri, and even al-Tabri does not hold to universal, general textual corruption, and I challenge you to show me he does. It seems quite clear he just thinks that there were Christians and Jews who distorted texts. Okay, but that's just a local event that doesn't do anything. Again, remember, if we're being consistent, if you apply that kind of understanding, you would also have to think, if I got a Quran and I edited it, then according to your logic, I've just changed the Quran. I've just corrupted the Quran. But of course you would deny that. You'd say, no, of course you haven't. You've just took one random copy of it and edited it. Well, yeah, likewise with the Injil and Torah. All of the cases that you bring, not a single one demonstrates universal general textual corruption of the Injil or Torah. Not a single one. All they do at absolute most is say that some Christians textually corrupted something. Again, that's not sufficient. The overwhelming evidence that we can look at demonstrates a few points, and let's just list them out. Number one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Injil, according to Islamic scholars, that Muhammad had at his time and that he's referring to in the Quran. And again, I challenge you to show me that this isn't the case. Oh, and just real quick to, to demonstrate this, I presented an article from Dr. Martin Akkad, who has actually looked at early Islamic scholars whose writing includes references to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in their work. Some of them, like Ibn Qutayba, were actually using it in their own hadith studies and using it as arguments to validate their own opinions. Dr. Martin Akkad actually lists out in a table all of the different references he finds in the following Islamic scholars dating from the 9th century to the 14th century, and then he proceeds to list out all the verses of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that they quote in reference and in support of their work. So point one, I think, is quite clearly established. Point two is that the early Islamic scholars did not think that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were completely useless and totally corrupt universally and generally, meaning there was no authentic Injil or no authentic Torah that was available at the time of Muhammad. You actually bring up a quote where one early Islamic scholar actually refers to the genuine Injil and then proceeds to quote from our gospel. So yes, clearly, the early Islamic scholars still believed that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John contained the words of the Holy Spirit. Well, no, that contains the words of Allah. Point three, it wasn't until much later, and a good argument to be made in the 11th century, that there were arguments put forward by people like Ibn Hazm to distance the Quran from the Injil and the Torah by claiming that whatever that was is not what we have today in terms of identity. It's not the same thing. Whereas early scholars would actually say, no, there is a relationship here in identity. The issue is either in Tali Falmana, the, the Christians are misunderstanding it, this seems to be Ibn Qutayba's opinion, or that some copies were edited by some Christians or some Jews. Usually it's Jews if you look at the Quranic narrative. There isn't really much basis for Christians doing this, but it will be applied to Christians anyway, that they have, in very specific circumstances, made copies. But again, it's only a select group of people. It's not all Jews. It's certainly not all the Jews across the entire world and the Jewish diaspora. What's interesting to note is, even in the 14th century, it's been noted by certain Islamic scholars that actually the general consensus among Muslim scholars is that the majority of the Injil and the Torah have been preserved and are still the words from Allah. We can see this in Ibn Taymiyyah's work where he says the following. If by it they mean the Quran confirms the textual veracity, the alfaz of the scriptural books which they now possess, that is the Torah and the Gospel. That is something which some Muslims will grant them, and many Muslims will dispute. However, most Muslims will grant them most of that. In other words, according to Ibn Taymiyyah, he makes it clear that the majority of scholarship still favours the view, according to him anyway, 
that the Torah and the Injil are still mostly preserved and mostly authoritative and mostly inspired. The problem with that view, of course, is how on earth do you deal with the fact that Muhammad held Christians accountable to this mostly preserved book, while also contradicting pretty much every single major theme in that book. Again, we have the issue of identity. How can you meaningfully say that the Injil we have today, that would have been the same at the time of Muhammad, is mostly preserved but has some textual corruptions, but then also contradict all of the central themes in the book? It seems like you're not talking about the same book. It seems like you actually have a very different understanding of what the Injil is, despite the fact that we know historically that's what Christians at the time, and even Jews at the time, would have thought the Injil was. It also brings us back nicely to the problem of, well, the Quran makes it clear that the Jews are to hold by the Injil, for example, otherwise they will be considered among the disbelievers. Well, how is that possible if most of the themes in the Injil have now been textually corrupted, according to the Islamic claim, and they've been replaced with claims that are pure blasphemy from the perspective of Islam, from the perspective of the Quran, there's no way these can be reconciled. So if they can't be reconciled, like Jesus being God, for example, seems like a bit of a major thematic problem from the Quran's perspective, how can you agree with the Quran that Christians ought to follow the Injil and they will be considered among the disbelievers if they don't at the time of Muhammad, the seventh century, when these questions about canon and so on have long been answered, how does that make any sense? How does that make any sense whatsoever? It seems clear to me that there's an error here, the Quran has made an error, and that's the most simple and basic way of understanding this. Appealing to the Christian understanding of the Muslim point, I think it's just generally very weak. I don't see any reason why we ought to do that, but even if I grant that we should do that, really it just doesn't get us anywhere because how do I know that's what the Muslims believe? Why can't I just say the Christians misunderstood the Muslims? I mean, tons of cases of religious disputes that fundamentally originate with a misunderstanding. You would need to demonstrate to me that the Christians have the correct understanding of this, and I don't see any reason to assume they do. Again, does the Pope know Islamic theology more than actual Islamic scholars that you hold dearly? To say yes seems a bit weird, and I don't know, I don't see any reason to do it. Second of all, my challenge still hasn't been met. You need to show me a universal, general case of textual corruption meaning that all Torah and all Injils have been textually replaced by some corrupted form across all of Christendom and all of the Jewish diaspora. But I look forward to seeing if you can. That is my challenge to you. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you're not a Christian yet, then today's the day. You can email me at Chris at Speaker's Corner. My email is down in the description box below. I hope you have a blessed day and that includes you proving Islam. And I will see you all in the next video. Take care.